A prize-winning poet and a longtime columnist for the nation, Katha Pollitt last joined us in 2006 for her essay collection, Virginity or Death, and Other Social and Political Issues of Our Time. We thought that given the recent challenges to abortion rights in Pennsylvania, Texas, Missouri, and Louisiana, among other states, and the publication of Pollitt's new book, Pro, Reclaiming Abortion Rights, it was high time we invited her back. As you might expect, her new book makes an impassioned argument for a renewed commitment to the struggle for abortion rights. A recent review in the Chicago Tribune sums up the book this way. Throughout Pro, Pollitt maintains a moral clarity, arguing not just for reproductive rights, but for reproductive justice, which places the right to mother or not within the global context of human rights and social and economic justice, inextricable from the fight for universal health insurance, immigration reform, and a host of social challenges. It's a holistic vision of a more just society that in her telling is at once utterly reasonable and heartbreakingly elusive. Please welcome Katha Collett. Thank you so much for that introduction. That, that review was so heartwarming. Um, so I've been, um, and thank you all for being here. Um, I've been reading the introduction to the book because that gives a kind of taste of what it's all about. But now that has been published in The Nation as a cover story, so maybe some of you have already read it. And then it occurred to me that mostly with a nonfiction book, people don't get to the end of it, you know. <laughs> So I thought I'd read, I would read the beginning of the last chapter, um, which is uh, called Reframing Motherhood, because the, the point of the book, really, I, I want to, I'll just explain it a little bit, I, I want to flip the whole abortion paradigm, which is abortion is a terrible thing, it stands in contrast to motherhood, the kind of women who have abortions and the kind of women who have children, completely different, one is a slut, the other is very good, um, and I wanted to say, no, these are, this is all part of the continuum of the reproductive lives of women. Uh, when you have one in three women having at least one abortion by menopause, you can't really see it as something separate from the normal life that women have, in, especially in a society where about half of all pregnancies are accidental. Um, so I wanted to sort of show how abortion, far from being, you know, something that's for sluts uh, and cold-hearted career women and all the other stereotypes um, that the abortion uh, opponents put out, um, to show that it is part of, uh, it's a social good. It's, it helps women. It helps women get their education. It helps them work. It helps them have children at a time when they can best take care of those children. Um, and it helps society because society needs the talents of those women, and society needs families that are um, happy to be there, <laughs> um, and uh, that where people um, can take care of each other well, which you can't do if you're having children at random moments in your life. Um, and um, so that was, uh, that was the thesis of the book, was to put abortion back in the context of motherhood and of what we need to have in our society to have uh, people being able to lead a good, rational life. Um, so I go through all that at uh, some length, and I thought that actually I should have, they should have sold this book to the public as this is the book that will let you argue with your uncle at Thanksgiving and win and win. Um, so anyway, but at the end of the book, I, I get around to finally to talking about motherhood, which is something that, as I'm sure you all know, our society pays a certain amount of lip service to, but really that's it. So we have a society that says basically, oh, you got pregnant. Well, you slut, you have to have a baby. Oh, you have a baby. Well, that's not my problem. So it's like the worst of both worlds. So anyway, here's uh, my take on how, um, uh, my thoughts on all that. 
So the la it's the last chapter. It's called Reframing Motherhood, and this is just the beginning. Okay. People think of pregnant women as weak and vulnerable. But when I was pregnant with my daughter, I felt as if I could put my hand in fire and it would only glow. I never felt alone. There were two of us right there. I didn't think of my child as an embryo or a fetus, medical words that belonged in a textbook or an abortion debate. I thought of her first as a funny little sea creature of indeterminate sex, and later, yes, as a baby, even though she was only a baby in my thoughts. Like many couples, her father and I even had a pet name for her, Winky. I wasn't a mother yet, but I was preparing to be one long before she was born. Waiting for the amnio tests to come back, I spent a lot of time wondering what genetic anomalies, as we are taught to call them, because defects sound so judgmental, I could live with, that is, the baby could live with. Blind, fine, deaf, fine, but what about blind and deaf? Down syndrome, fragile X, Turner syndrome. As it turned out, I was lucky. The tests showed nothing abnormal, and I did not have to decide. I did not even know about the most disastrous possibilities anencephaly, or organs growing outside the body like some strangling vine. Today, if I'd gotten test results like that and lived in a state that bans abortion after 20 weeks, I might have to travel to a distant state. I would be able to afford it, but what about the women who can't? What happens to them now? Do they have to carry their doomed winky inside until it, uh, sorry, do they have to carry their doomed winky until it dies inside them or go through childbirth? for the sake of life? We think we value mothers in America, but we don't. We may revere motherhood, the hazy abstraction, the cream of wheat with a halo ideal, but a mother is just a kind of woman after all, and women are trouble and not so valuable. Low-income mothers drag down the country. Why'd they have kids if they couldn't support them? Middle-class mothers are boring frumps. Elite ones are obsessed sanctimommies, don't they know how annoying they are with their yoga, their cat fights over diapers and breastfeeding, their designer strollers that take up half the sidewalk so that people with important places to go have to take several extra steps? Motherhood is interesting to the larger culture to the extent it can be turned into a sexual fantasy, the MILF. I won't spell what, out what that is you should know by now, or as a way to set women against one another or to make judgments about them, or as a rationale to limit women's ability to do anything else, or as a way to manufacture that debilitating fog of guilt and anxiety that saps so many women's vitality and confidence. But in itself, taking care of children is not of great interest to the world at large. The world work of mothers is so unvalued that a judge in Nebraska previously a lawyer for Operation Rescue, can deny a 16-year-old in foster care the abortion she wants on the grounds that she isn't mature enough to choose abortion. But apparently, she is mature enough to go through pregnancy and childbirth and raise a child. Anybody can do that. Aristotle thought a woman was a deformed man. Something had gone wrong in conception. Perhaps the south wind was blowing instead of the more vigorous north. And although we may not believe in women's inferiority consciously anymore, the burden is on the woman if she wishes to participate fully in life, which has been organized around the ideal of the male worker without significant responsibilities at home. The burden is also on her if she has children, voluntarily or not, and if she doesn't have children, because what kind of woman doesn't have children? Also, if she has sex, voluntarily or not, she is the one who has to use contraception and use it right or pay the price for its failure. Are men held up to public scorn for fumbling the condom or not withdrawing in time or for that matter, assuming that his partner has taken care of birth control already? She is the stupid one, the careless one, the one who forgot for two minutes how easily her body could betray her. It is as if a woman lugs her reproductive system around her like a fur coat in July. She can't be expected to move about freely like a normal person in that hot, bulky garment. But she could take it off, couldn't she, if she really wanted to? Under these conditions, the ability to end a pregnancy is deeper than a right. It is basic self-preservation. 
Maybe there could be a society in which women were legally compelled to bear every child they conceived, and yet did not find themselves thereby hampered, impoverished, trapped, chained to a hated partner, consigned to a lesser life. But that society would look nothing like the one abortion opponents want to bring about, which is basically a more retrograde version of our own, with women tied for decades to raising children as dependent wives or struggling single mothers. Could there be a society in which having a baby in high school made no difference to a girl's bright future? In which motherhood was such a light role, there was no reason not to go along with a random pregnancy because, say, children were raised communally, as in the original Israeli kibbutzim, and fear of being legally connected to the wrong man was not a factor because the woman had complete control over whether he stayed in her life and the child's life in which pregnancy outside marriage was regarded so benignly and motherhood was so richly rewarded with scholarships, housing, job opportunities, government subsidies, social prestige, and more, that a woman had nothing to lose and much to gain by bearing an accidental baby. It's all starting to sound like some sort of socialist matriarchy, which isn't at all what abortion opponents have in mind. To them, motherhood is more about hatching a baby less about what comes after. When the little one comes, you'll love it and everything will work out. Meanwhile, here are some secondhand baby clothes. The trouble with this view is not just that a woman can't return to the crisis pregnancy center and get help with groceries for her five-year-old or go back to medical school when her baby starts kindergarten. It's that it presents having a child as no big deal. Any woman can do it, even a 12-year-old, and either just get on with her life or give the baby up. Once she gives birth, her job is practically done. This cavalier attitude about childbearing and child rearing is an exaggerated version of the way motherhood is valued or not by society generally. The whole world runs on women's unpaid or grossly underpaid labor, and it always has. When that work is an extension of female domestic roles, caring for children or the elderly, preparing food, cleaning houses, it is ill-paid, insecure, low-skilled, and low-status. But when it is done within the family, it is so deeply mystified and romanticized, so wrapped in religion, morality, tradition, and ideas about what's natural, that it looks like something else a free gift of love, a personal preference, a private arrangement that stands outside the marketplace and cannot be judged by outsiders. And yet, if women rejected labor within the family, society would have to pay enormous sums to replace it. At least elder care is generally recognized to be a personal sacrifice. Some states will even pay relatives a small sum through Medicaid to keep an elderly person out of a nursing home. The social value of motherhood is much more hidden. In fact, it is so obscured that in 2009, Senator John Kyle, Republican of Arizona, tried to strike pregnancy and childbirth from the list of conditions employers had to include in their health plans under the Affordable Care Act. I don't need maternity care, Kyle argued. I think your mom probably did, Senator Debbie Stabenow, Democrat of Michigan, tartly replied. But Kyle continued, so requiring that on my insurance policy is something I don't need and will make the policy more expensive. The Harvard economist Greg Mankiw also objects to the community rating of maternity care. The goal is to spread the risk of childbirth among the larger community, he wrote on his blog. But having children is more a choice than a random act of nature. People who drive a new Porsche pay more for car insurance than those who drive an old Chevy. We consider that fair because which car you drive is a choice. Why isn't having children viewed in the same way? Economists. <laughs> yeah. Leaving aside the fact that not all childbearing is so voluntary, is a baby like a luxury car? The social value of Porsches is very low. If nobody bought them, or yachts, or diamond-encrusted Rolexes, or Jackson Pollocks, the world would go on much the same. But children are immensely important to everyone, including people who don't have any or want any. They, are val they have value both as the children they are, 
giving meaning and purpose and joy, not just to their parents, but grandparents, aunts, uncles, family, friends, to say nothing of providing employment for millions of teachers, caregivers, pediatricians, nurses, toy makers, and so on, and also as the adults they become. They are the future, after all. If women stopped having babies, the human race would end, and Mankiw would have no students in his Ec 101 class. <laughs> and if women stop raising babies to adulthood, usually quite competently, despite the cost to themselves, and without anything remotely like enough support from the community whose costs Mankiw is so worried about, who would do that work? Mankiw trivializes motherhood as a socially useless individual choice. Abortion opponents who glorify motherhood in the abstract trivialize it more subtly by making it a question of no choice, of one size fits all biological fate. They deny its physical risks, its social and economic costs, and its enormous personal consequences. They disregard the individual circumstances and inner life of the pregnant woman. They equate the value of a grown woman with that of a zygote. They entwine childbearing with the very different issues of chastity and sexual continence and use the threat of pregnancy to enforce their own repressive sexual mores. But whether a baby is a free personal choice or what you get for being a slut or God's beautiful gift to rape victims, the practical result is the same. Whatever difficulties motherhood entails are the problem of individual mothers. What if we respected pregnancy and childbirth as major phys physical, psychological, and economic events as work? There's a reason they call childbirth labor. Making a healthy baby takes effort. It requires foresight and self-denial and courage. It's expensive and demanding and tiring. You have to learn new things, change many habits, possibly deal with complicated medical situations, make difficult decisions, and undergo stressful ordeals. I had a wisdom tooth pulled out without Novocaine while I was pregnant. It hurt a lot and seemed to go on forever. The kindness of the very young dental assistant holding back my hair as I splat spat blood into a bowl will stay with me for the rest of my life. Pregnant women do such things and much harder things all the time. For example, they give birth, which is somewhere on the scale between painful and excruciating. Or they have a cesarean, as I did, which is major surgery. None of this is without risk of death or damage or trauma, including psychological trauma. To force girls and women to undergo this against their will is to annihilate their humanity. When they undertake it by choice, we should all be grateful that there is no way to equalize men's contribution to reproduction is all the more reason to honor women for volunteering to go through it on their behalf. The world must be peopled, Benedict says, in Much Ado About Nothing. But the only time we recognize the social value of childbearing is when we are blaming middle-class white women for not doing enough of it. To a far greater degree than most other Western nations, we have decided that women should individually bear most of the consequences of becoming a parent. The sexual puritanism of conservative Christianity meets the conservative libertarianism of Greg Mankiw. Why should I pay for your birth control or your abortion or your baby? Get a husband. The results are all around us. In the highest rates by far of teen pregnancy and teen childbearing in the West, struggling single mothers, downwardly mobile families, child poverty. That this is degrading to women is obvious, but it is also degrading to motherhood. It turns what should be a source of strength and power and recognition into something that renders women weak and dependent, blocks them from full participation in life, undermines their economic standing, and leaves too many poor in old age, if not before. Perhaps that is the point. When you consider the way restrictions on abortion go hand in hand with cutbacks in social programs and stymied gender equality, it is hard not to suspect that the aim is to put women and children back under male control by making it impossible for them to survive outside it. So that's the gauntlet I throw down. To, so. Anyway. So thank you all for listening to that. Um, I, I think it's um, questions and answers now. I think um, 
Andy's going to handle that. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to, how we do that. So raise your hand, and here comes a microphone. Try it again. It's one of those mics. I'm sure you read the article within the last couple months by Emily Bazelon in the New York Times, and I forget the name of the pill, but that they're now selling abortion across continents. I just wanted you to comment on that. And maybe, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you mean, um, do you mean um, my Suprastol? The yeah. abortion pill, and they've been selling yeah. it. You you can buy it on the on the internet. Yeah, and then um, I forget. I think it might have been in Nebraska where a woman bought it, and then she was um, charged or convicted with some crime for doing that. Well, you know what's really uh, I, I, I I'd like to talk a little bit about that because what we're seeing as more and more restrictions on abortion access come in. Uh, clinics are closing, uh, waiting periods are ratcheting up um, more and more. You have to jump through more and more hoops, which all, you know, the real purpose of all that is to raise the cost of the abortion by forcing you to, you know, stay overnight or over two nights or in Missouri over three nights in a distant place. And that means childcare, that means lost time at work. So the sticker price of an abortion is actually not the entire cost at all. Anyway, as the more that those things happen, um, and the harder it is to, for women to access abortion care at a clinic, uh, women are resorting to buying over the internet or down in Mexico where it's sold over the counter as an ulcer drug. Um, misoprostol, which will uh, cause a miscarriage in about 85% of cases. Um, and it's, you know, when you have a medication abortion in a clinic, um, as opposed to a surgical one, um, misoprostol is one of the two medications that you take. The other is RU486 or mifepristone, the so-called French abortion pill. Those two things work together. So, but you can buy the misoprostol fairly easily um, online or in Mexico and hope that that's what you get if you buy it online because there's really no quality control. Um, so, but it, uh, I'm, I don't remember the story about the Nebraska woman, but there's a story in Pennsylvania that is uh, tremendously disturbing, um, which is that a woman, um, Jennifer Whalen, I think her name is, she's the mother of a, t mother of a teenage girl who got pregnant and didn't want to have the baby. So um, because the clinic was 75 miles away and hampered around with various restrictions and costs and all like that, they had the idea of ordering uh, uh, misoprostol over the internet. And uh, the daughter took it, and then they sort of mistook the symptoms of a normal miscarriage for something that was medically a problem. They went to the hospital. The hospital turned them in. Two years later, the prosecutor had figured out what to charge them with. Given, and this was like a not a third trimester abortion. This was a, a you know a, a, a mid trimester abortion or even a first trimester. I don't remember when it was, but it was not like particularly late. And Jennifer Whalen was uh, was sentenced to I think a, a year or a little more in jail for doing something, for self -abor for facilitating the self-abortion. Um, but, you know, think about it. The reason why self-abortion was ever illegal was to protect women from, un from illegal abortion, from unsafe procedures. Not, oh, if you can't come up with this money, if you can't drive this far, if you can't jump through all these hoops, then it's a crime if you take the law into your own hands. Um, so anyway, that just shows so, it's so cruel and how determined they were, you know, two years um, coming back at her for this. It's really, it's really so, so terrible. And that kind of thing is happening all over. 
um, especially like in, in, in Texas, where women go down to Mexico, in that enormous part of Texas where now women are, you know, hundreds of miles from a clinic. And um, I think we'll see much more of that. Another question, yeah, right here in the center. Either one of you can get her a mic. Hi, um, that, your reading was very interesting. Um, Thank you. How do you account for the um, historical trend towards accepting uh, gay people so much more uh, recently with the converse historical trend towards um, sort of reducing uh, women's rights? I mean, there it just seems to be this sort of an opposite uh, trend towards accepting gay people more and towards rejecting women's rights more? Well, it's such an interesting question, um, and I'm sure um, there are lots of reasons. I'll just mention a few that have occurred to me. One is um, um, LBGT rights are actually those people asking to be included in conservative social institutions, marriage, they want to get married, they want to go, go into the army, and they want to join the clergy. Uh, um, and so, wonder, I'm not, and those are wonderful, you know, they should have those rights, you know, it's completely good. But the appeal is basically on the old American inc uh, belief in inclusion and fairness. Um, uh, Abortion rights are different. Abortion rights actually are kind of radical, I think. That it really changes the understanding of what the social position of women is. Um, from, you know, basically motherhood is the default position for you. Most important thing you'll ever do, and you better do it. Um, it further cuts the connection between sex and reproduction, which is very disturbing to a lot of people. And let's remember, gay people want the right to adopt. So they want the right to form families and have children. Abortion is all about the right to either not do that or do it at a different time, do it on your own timetable. That's very radical. Another thing I think is too, you know, abortion rights is just about women. It's a right that only women have. Um, and it's one of the few things um, well, I don't want to say it's one of the few things because I'm sure you can all think of some others, but it, it is a right that women exercise by themselves on their own behalf. They don't, if, as long as they're of age, they don't need their husband's permission, although a lot of Americans think they should have to do that. They don't need their parents' position, um, uh, permission, and um, I think that's very threatening to a lot of people. Whereas Gay and lesbian rights, half of it is about men and their rights. And very well, you know, the leaders of the gay rights movement are socially powerful men. Um, and that's not true with abortion rights. Um, so those are, those are just a couple of thoughts about that. Um, but yeah, it is, um, it is um, interesting that gay rights have moved so far, so quickly. And abortion rights are um, sort of stuck. Um, yeah. So thanks for that very good question. Another question. Yeah, on the aisle here. Uh, you convinced me to give more money to Planned Parenthood, uh, actually. <laughs> good. Uh, but uh, the big question is it looks like the, the trend in this country is going in the wrong way in terms of the fact that we're having now states will be almost impossible to have abortions in the future. And there'll be other states that are presuming that will maintain these rights. So how do we reverse this? And also, just one more sort of a, a related kind of a question is that part of the argument always is that, as you mentioned about zygotes, as soon as you have a fertilized egg, that's a human being. How do we reverse that? That's an argument, it's a religious argument that it's just asserted, and there's no way you can, how do you deal with that? Well, to answer the second part of your question first, which was about um, the fertilized egg as uh, a person, there's a whole chapter in my book about personhood where I kind of dismantle all that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a religious idea, and religious idea is, um, you know, if that's your idea, if that's what you think, God says, fine, that's for you. But we live in a pluralistic society, and I would 
I would remind everybody uh, uh, of that, which, and um, the belief that um, a fertilized egg is a baby equal to a baby and a born woman and a 40-year-old is something that is particular to the Catholic Church um, and has now sort of spread to evangelical churches who didn't used to think that, but now they do. Um, and I would just say, well, you know, in Judaism, um, you become a person when you draw your first breath and not before. Um, and so you have to ask, what is a person? Is a person just DNA? If it is just DNA, then we have to get rid of in vitro fertilization because that involves the destruction of zygotes. Um, because you only implant, you create a whole bunch, you implant some, you throw away the rest. If one of them is, um, you know, is abnormal, you certainly don't implant that. So that's really a tremendous, you know, anti-disability thing there. Um, so, uh, you know, if you, there's a way of reducing this uh, to its logical absurdity that I think might um, make some people think, because people support fertility medicine, which is banned by the Catholic Church just the way abortion is, and they don't even like um, artificial insemination. They don't like anything that creates a baby without, you know, father and mother getting it on, um, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> you don't usually think of them as being all for getting it on, but um, there, that's the time that they do. Um, so, you know, I think if you also, if you think it's a person, then not only does in vitro medicine have to, in vitro fertilization have to go, the distinction that many, many Americans love to make between the good abortion and the bad abortion, that has to go too. Um, so, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I'm against abortion except for rape um, or the life and health of the mother. Well, from the point of view of a fertilized egg, how it got there, I mean, Rick Santorum is completely right. How it got in there is irrelevant. It's there now. Um, and it's God's beautiful gift. Um, and the way of making something good come out of your rape. And there are plenty of anti-abortion proponents who will say that, but they don't, um, then everybody laughs at them. <laughs> but really, they're, they're kind of right, logically. Um, so you have to think about that. And you have to think also, well, okay, Let's say I do have a life-threatening pregnancy. Well, I'm not allowed to kill another person to protect my health. You know, I can't say, oh, my kidney is failing. You've, you've got a kidney. I think I'll knock you out and cut you up and take it. You can't do that. Um, so there, too, the extreme anti-choice position is the logical one. Um, and... I think that uh, people don't want to think of those things because basically, in my view, the opposition to abortion is about women and sex. So that if you get pregnant voluntarily, you can't have an abortion, and if you get pregnant involuntarily, well, then it's okay. Then you're, you're the innocent victim. Um, and if it's, you don't want to have a baby because you want to finish school, too bad for you, but if you don't want to have a baby because it's going to destroy your, your physical health, well, okay, then we'll let you do it. Um, so I, th but all those qualifications have nothing to do with the moral status of the unborn. They have to do with the circumstances of the woman and the wish of people to judge those circumstances and to judge them quite harshly. So I don't know, that would be, you know, if you could pin those people down for long enough to explain all that to them, maybe it would be interesting to see what they would say. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot the first half of your question. Um, oh, right, yeah. So the, yes, that's the, where we're going. You know, I was talking to a um, wonderful journalist, Robin Marty, um, who writes about abortion all the time. Um, and I said, well, what do you think is going to happen in the next few years? She says, I think we're going to see a you know, uh, abortion will be illegal in the red states. It will, I mean, it will be inaccessible in the red states. It won't exist, basically. And it'll continue to exist in, on the coast, in some coastal states. And it'll be, you know, 
a, a complete patchwork, but if you live in one of those red states, you'll have to somehow get yourself to some other place um, where it's still available. And I thought she was being too negative because I'm a sort of optimistic kind of person. But I think we're seeing that happening right now. When you have six or seven states with only one clinic, then how available is abortion? Um, for example, take Missouri. You know, when it was in the Dakotas, the Dakotas are very far away um, from most other states. Um, <laughs> and they're very low population. Very few people live there. So you could sort of say, okay, that's them. Um, at, but abortion is safe where, where I am. But now we're seeing uh, Missouri, which is a big state with, you know, one big city, St. Louis, and some other fairly sizable states. They have one clinic for all those millions of people. And now they have a three-day waiting period. And they're working very hard on closing that clinic. They're, they're just, you know, trying to turn over every legal uh, leaf that they can to get rid of it. So that's very serious. Now, if you live at one end of Missouri, you have to get yourself to St. Louis. You have to stay there for three days to have your procedure. That, uh, that cuts out a lot of people. Miss Mississippi only has one, one, one clinic. Um, and we're seeing uh, on the ballot in uh, three states, or these, uh, in two states have a personhood amendment on the ballot, which would basically shut down, well, not just abortion, but fertility medicine and some methods of birth control and uh, raise tremendous problems with end-of-life issues, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in Tennessee, they want to amend the state constitution to say specifically, you know, nothing in here protects a woman's right to abortion, which would have the same effect. Um, so I think that we will probably, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But I don't want to leave you all, uh, th leave that question in a totally uh, despairing way because I think we are starting to see some pushback. Um, for example, last year, California became actually the only state to pass a pro-choice law, but it was an important one, and California is a very important, big, huge state, um, and the law was to allow non-physicians uh, like, um, not you know, me, but uh, <laughs> nurses and physician's assistants and, and similar to perform early abortions. And that is tremendous. That will really help with the problem of too few providers um, and with, um, you know, people who live in parts of California where they, they're not near a clinic. So, uh, you know, and, and other states are beginning to wake up a little too. I mean, and the pro-choice movement is becoming a little more assertive. So that's all good. Um, so, but I think it will be, I think it will be that patchwork for a while until I hope the people in the states that don't have access anymore say, wait a minute, what did we do? This is terrible. Now my daughter can't get an abortion. Um, so, here's hoping. Katha, can you talk a little bit about immigrants and access to, uh, undocumented in particular? And yeah. access to abortion right well see this is an interesting thing in in texas especially they have a lot of undocumented immigrants specifically in the rio grande valley which is where um you know clinics have been um forced to close um and but throughout texas uh you know there are i think there are 20 or 21 clinics now where there were just half what there were a few years ago so if you're an undocumented immigrant in Texas and you have to travel, you have to deal with checkpoints along the way of the highway that, uh, where they check for your papers. So people are very afraid. You know, it's very, all very well for Judge Edith Jones of the Fifth Circuit to say, oh, well, it's a big, it's a big state. What's 150 miles? Just drive fast, you know? Um, but um, the fact is, in that 150 miles, you are very likely to be asked for your papers, and if you don't have them, you're in, you know, you're in big trouble. So um, that's another reason why it's very important to have access that is that is local. Um, so um, so there's a lot of that, um, and uh, immigrant women are at special at special risk. And you know, this is a uh, just to 
digress a little bit about a story from Ireland, where, as you know, abortion, you know, completely illegal. I mean, now they're supposed to have an exception for the life of the mother, but it requires so much, so jumping through so many hoops, it's, I don't think anyone has been able to take advantage of it yet. But anyway, so there was a woman, and she was an immigrant, um, and she, was, she had been raped, and she was pregnant, and she said, I want an abortion. And she couldn't leave to go to the UK, which is what Irish women do. And that's called the Irish solution to an Irish problem, which is you just, just don't talk about it, just go have your abortion, then come back. Uh, and so she couldn't do that. And what they did was so terrible, which is they strung her along from the time she was eight weeks pregnant, when she could have taken the, the pill, um, to the time she was 24 weeks along. And then they said, oh, OK, now you can have a cesarean. <laughs> Yes, I mean, it's so cruel, so cruel, forcing her through all this trauma and, um, you know, upsetness. And also a cesarean is, is quite, a, quite a deal. And now, you know, is, did, this, did the baby survive? Is it okay? What? You know, I mean, it's all just so awful. And that all happened because she was an immigrant and she was stuck in Ireland. And that kind of thing, I, I think, happens in, will happen in the United States, too. Um, so that was a good question. Some more questions, yeah. Gentleman on the aisle and then a uh, lady about what do you... Well, I'm first. really interested. Um, you made out a pretty good argument for why economically for all of us uh, it makes sense for women to have choice. And yet, as far as I can tell, there are a huge number of women who are anti-choice. Mm -hmm. And I understand you can parse them out into people who are totally religious, but it's, it's beyond that. So they're colluding in this. Uh, and many of them are quite bright, and I wonder if you can imagine your way into figuring out how they get there, how they get themselves into that uh, as sort of self-destructive position in some ways. Well, if you look at it the way we do, yes, it is self-destructive because they're depriving themselves of a freedom. But I think that for them, it looks different. Um, and uh, Kristen Luker wrote a wonderful book, the sociologist Kristen Luker wrote a wonderful book called The Politics of Motherhood that came out, I think, at the end of the 70s. I, was that, is that right? Yeah, I don't exactly remember. And it was, um, it was about uh, pro-life and pro-choice women and how differently they saw the world. And the pro-life women saw motherhood as the central, you know, wonderful task of women. And they saw it as a way of binding the family, um, binding men to them for support. Um, it was a way of getting respect. Um, they didn't have the idea of um, uh, individual, you know, equality with men. They didn't. They had a different perspective, an older perspective. And so, for them, um, if women could have abortions, which of course they were having. This is a way that it, it, it sort of lets men off the hook in a way, um, that men don't have to marry them and support them. Now, that, was all, that, that has pretty much fallen apart. You know, I, it does seem sort of strange for you know, women to be arguing for the return of the shotgun marriage. Um, but once you have the idea that marriage is something where you should be happy, and um, all the rest, but so they're they're just operating in a different framework, um, and I think religion. I just think you can't underestimate the power of religion in this issue. Um, that you know, you ask yourself, why is it that Europe, there there is no you know significant pro-life movement with any political um, heft in Western Europe, except for of course Ireland. Um, why is that? Well, it's because they're much more secular countries, um, and their politics are organized very differently. In our country, we have two major religions, the Catholic Church and the evangelical fundamentalist denominations, especially the Southern Baptists, um, who have uh, become f allied politically with the Republican Party. And they are the base, anti-abortion people are the base of the Republican Party. Um, and uh, even, you know, so that then you get even a, a kind of a reasonable Republican, like Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney has to be anti-choice. Um, they all have to.
be anti-choice. All the, pro, you know, and that, that's a new thing. This is interesting. That is a new thing. If you go back to the 60s and the 70s, it was not the case that the Democrats were in favor of birth control and legal abortion and the Republicans were opposed to those things. It was much more mixed um, because you had all those Boston Brahmin Republicans and uh, business Republicans and liberal small government kind of Republicans and people like Margaret Chase Smith and all that. That's all gone. Remember Bob Packwood? He was a, a total stone pro-choicer. Um, there were a lot of them. Um, the Democrats were actually a little more against those things because their base included ethnic urban Catholics. Um, working class ethnic urban Catholics who tended to be of a more traditional bent on family issues. So, so you had the Republican Party and then it needs people to vote for it and it says, aha, here are all these anti-choice people, we'll, we'll go for them. And that's what they did. And now they're stuck with them. <laughs> now they're stuck with them. Because if they didn't have those people, there wouldn't be enough people to vote for them and say, oh yeah, let's give rich people all the money, sure, fine. Uh, so. <laughs> They, had to, they have to think of something, some other reason to vote for them. Um, so, um, but that's all new. You know, we tend to think of these alliances and convictions as being ancient, but it's like, it's like Islamic fundamentalism. It's a new thing. It's a new modern thing. And so is the current anti-choice movement. Um, and there was one more thing I wanted to say about that. Um, which is, did it go out of my head? It might have gone out of my head. Maybe it'll occur to me later. Um, yeah, it did go out of my head, sorry. <laughs> um, it was very smart. Uh, so, <laughs> too smart to stay in here. Uh, so, oh, I know what it was about how this is a new formulation. Okay, a lot of people don't know this, so I'm telling you. Um, in 1968, Ronald Reagan, Republican governor of California, signed what was then the most liberal abortion law in the country. The, you know, the Republican god, Ronald Reagan, was pro-choice and had to have a conversion later for political purposes. In the same time period, while abortion was still mostly illegal, but people were beginning to be bothered by that because it, 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 it uh, provoked so much tragedy, um, a number of Protestant denominations um, issued statements about uh, in calling for the liberalization of abortion, abortion law. And guess who was in that list? The Southern Baptists. So now they're completely, they're not only against abortion under any circumstances, they're, against, they're, be, they're turning against birth control. Um, which they have persuaded themselves is really a form of abortion, like birth control pills is baby pesticide and chemical abortion and all like that. They're just on the edge of uh, saying that's, no, that's all no good. Um, but, you know, was, the Bible hasn't changed since the late 60s when they issued that statement. They have changed. <laughs> they have changed. Um, so all these, this is a, a new political configuration um, that is very powerful. It's very powerful. And if we didn't have, if they didn't have that, if they didn't have the churches as their base where people come together every Sunday, people donate money, people write letters, people organize the march, people do all the things people do, you know, in, in, in churches, and then they all go vote together. If they were, if it was just individuals, they would never have gotten this far. I mean, there are anti-choice people who are not religious. I'm not saying that there are gay, there's a gay pro-lifers, feminists for life, which is actually sort of a, very related to the Catholic Church. Um, but um, there are, you know, you can be a person against abortion and have any faith or no faith, but you wouldn't have that kind of political power unless you were connected to an already powerful institution. It would just be one of the things you thought. Um, so, they don't have any of this in Europe, and although I'm sure there are people who oppose abortion in Europe, they don't get anywhere. And in Europe, it's going the other way. Abortion is becoming, laws are becoming more liberalized. Time for a couple more questions, lady right there, and then we'll go back to the gal behind you. Years ago here in Philadelphia at the Ethical Cultural Society, I heard a lecture by a former member of Jane, mm. which was an underground 
illegal mm -hmm. abortion movement functioned for years and they never lost anybody. I wonder, uh, her argument was that we have been brainwashed into f over medicalizing abortion and uh, believing it to be uh, far more dangerous than in fact it is. Women have been doing it for each other for centuries. Are you aware of underground or otherwise uh, movements now that are making this argument or talking among themselves about this as another way to provide abortion women to women? Um, I think there are a few women that are handing out misoprostol. Uh, one of them was interviewed on um, Ronan Farrow's show. There was a little video clip, and she said that she, she would buy misoprostol on the internet, and she would give it to anyone who asked her for it. She would never charge for it, but she would give it out. I think that there's a little bit of that. Um, and, um, but I don't think there's anything as organized as Jane yet, but that may happen. That may happen. See, the thing about misoprostol, though, see, it only works 85% of the time. So then 15% of the time, it doesn't work. You're still pregnant. It's later, et cetera. So women and women, you know, that's not good. Women get in trouble that way. Um, so, but I think, you know, people, I don't think it's going to be that women say, oh, I can't get a legal abortion. I guess I'll have to have this baby. <laughs> I think they'll do what they can to save themselves. Did you ever talk to Jamaica Kincaid and find out what her mom was drinking? No, I'm so curious. I have to write to her because I have a, a long quote from Jamaica Kincaid in the beginning where she talks about how in the Caribbean, when she was growing up, her mother and her, friend, and her mother's friends would gather in the yard and every month and they would drink this hot, dark drink that would uh, keep them unpregnant. Um, and I wonder what it is. There are, there are, you know, they're always looking for um, uh, herbal, herbal abortion. And I kind of looked into this, but don't try it. Don't try it. I mean, people have died. You know, like for example, they'll say pennyroyal is a, is a, a lot of these herbs are poisons. Um, and so the, the reason they give you an abortion is that they, are very destructive to your insides. And uh, there were women who have died in the last, you know, 10 years or so from drinking pennyroyal oil because the pennyroyal tea is supposedly an abortifacient. I don't know if it really is, but they took the oil like you can buy at the, you know, the herbal store and they died. So don't do it. Don't do it. Um, so um, I don't think the jury is in on these things that work. There is a professor, uh, John Riddle, um, in North Carolina, who's written several books about herbal abortion, which he believes were very um, widely used in the ancient world. Um, but a lot of people think that he's wrong. <laughs> so. Um, so. I hear all the time from people um, just so much misinformation about the physical health risks of getting a legal and safe abortion yes. in a medical clinic. Um, and I hear it from people on the street and then obviously also with all of the trap laws that have been mm -hmm. proposed in all these states yeah. that are like basing themselves off of these mm -hmm. concerns. Um, and I know a lot of it is coming from places like crisis pregnancy centers and things like that, but I guess, um, my question is, um, do you feel like there's more that pro-choice activists can be doing or a different strategy than what pro-choice activists have been using to combat the just sort of basic factual inaccuracies that are so prevalent? Um, I, that's, you raised such an important question. The anti-choice movement has been very successful in making abortion seem dangerous when it is actually not dangerous, and specifically it is 12 to 14 times less dangerous than childbirth, which is your only choice at that time. Um, and they uh, make it seem as if that the whole partial birth abortion thing was all about planting in people's minds the idea that an abortion takes place very late in pregnancy. And they'll say, they always say, you know, you can, Roe v. Wade says you can have an abortion up until the day before birth. This is ridiculous. This is just ridiculous. But, it, but I think people do have the idea, yeah, you know, you're immensely pregnant and then you have this abortion, oh, it's a great, big, terrible thing. Actually, 60% uh, of abortions happen in the first eight weeks of pregnancy when we're talking about an embryo, not a fetus. 
and almost 90% take place in the first trimester. Um, so there is no vi vi viable baby in there at that time. Um, it's very safe and all like that. And I think we need to talk about that um, because people believe uh, all kinds of things. I, actually, I asked abortion, some abortion providers what their patients can, you know, were they afraid? And they said, oh yeah, they're terrified. And they'll say, oh yeah, my friend told me you, you put a big pair of scissors up there. And you know, they have terrible ideas about what is involved. And that's why, just to say one more thing, uh, one thing that's very encouraging is uh, young, very young reproductive rights activists are really taking on that issue. For example, there's a woman named Emily Letts who um, made a video of her abortion and she showed, look, the clinic is very clean. I'm here, this is gonna, it takes three to five minutes. It's not some, you know, all day nightmare. Um, and she's calm and all that throughout. Um, that's really good. And other, another woman tweeted her abortion, which sounds so weird, um, but actually it had the same idea, showing that it is not um, a dangerous and painful procedure. Well, I'm sure this is not the last time we will be addressing this topic. Please join me in thanking Kathy Oh, Pollard. thank you so much.